the you have another 20 minutes left in the real exam if you're answering these questions and you answered three too many so um i think you'll agree there's lots of time to do these questions in the exam just use that time wisely don't get to the end of it and twiddle your thumbs get to the end of it and check your answers or something okay Seems to have frozen. Okay. So, first five questions again are about physics. Do the maths. If you need to have a pass mark of 75%, then how many questions about physics? Five questions out of 25, that's 20%. So that tells you that either you have to know some of the physics, some of the science, or you need to know everything else absolutely perfectly, and you might just scrape your 70 or 75% to pass so it's important everybody knows some of the physics and the more you the more you know the better of course okay so Bayes theorem relates the population characteristics to the test outcome now my bet is that most of you looked at that and said I don't have a clue and that I, I don't I don't think you can guess this one I don't think you use any inspirational clever ideas you either know what Bayes theorem is or you don't and um, the reason you should know what Bayes' theorem is, and the reason why I put this question here as the first question, is because the first thing in the BSE syllabus is Bayes' theorem. So if you've not heard of Bayes' theorem, that tells me that's because you've not read the BSE syllabus, i.e. the information you're supposed to know to pass the exam you're about to do in three weeks, and therefore you should do. So it's really important you could go away and read the BSE syllabus and pick out the things you've never heard of, like Bayes' theorem, and know what you mean. So what Bayes' theorem says, it says, if you take my dad, who's a 86-year-old, 85-year-old Scotsman who's had angioplasty in the past, and he comes and says to him, getting some chest pain, and you send him for a stress echo or an exercise test or something, and the exercise test is positive, you conclude he's got angina. Um, if my son comes to see you, who's 20-something, and he says to you, I've got some chest pain, and you somewhat stupidly decide to do an exercise test or a stress echo or something and it's positive the conclusion you come to there is that it's probably a false positive test because the chance of my dad having angina is extremely high and the chance of my son having angina at 21 or whatever is extremely low and that's exactly what Bayes theorem says it relates the pre-test probability to the test outcome so it says if you test people who are unlikely to have the disease, you'll get false positives. If you test people who are likely to have the disease, then you get true positives. So Bayes' theorem is important for the way that you um, um, go ahead, go, go about doing echocardiography. So you should know that. Sound waves are transverse waves. Around transverse waves, I mean, the medium goes up and down, while the wave goes at a direction at right angles to that. That's incorrect. Sound waves are longitudinal waves. The, the um, molecules vibrate backwards and forwards in the same direction that the wave's going in. Propagation velocity is the speed of the molecules of the medium. That's false. Propagation velocity is the speed of the wave. How quickly sound gets knocked on at. You know, that number that is fixed. Whatever you do, you can't change it. Um, 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 so, you know... 15, 40 meters per second for a sound wave in body tissue, for example. That's the speed of the wave. That's propagation of velocity. The speed of the molecules of the medium is very different. That's how quickly they're moving as they vibrate backwards and forwards. The piezoelectric effect relates mechanical deformation of the crystal to the frequency of the wave produced. No, no, no. It doesn't, does it? The piezoelectric effect says when you apply an electrical pressure, a voltage, to a piezoelectric crystal, the crystal changes shape. So piezoelectric effect relates voltage to deformation. What determines the frequency of the wave produced is the size and the shape of the crystal. And think of it like that gong that we discussed yesterday. So that was definitely false. Axial resolution is independent of lateral resolution. Well, you want to say yes, don't you? Because we talked about them and presented them as different things, one relating to beam width, one relating to, to um, 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 pulse um, length. Um, but actually, they're not quite independent because they are related through frequency and the size of the, 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 the um, crystal, the, the size of the, the crystal that makes the wavefront. So um, 
Um, um, in fact, that's just something you should know as they're not completely independent, even though we present them as sort of independent. TGC is required due to the physical property, property of attenuation. That's correct. We said that already. TGC is a linear scale. A linear scale is something that, for example, it meant every step that I took, I used um, one joule of energy. And that's not the case, because if you think of it as, um, um, you know, a wave carrying a lot of energy, that's more difficult to move than a wave carrying a little bit of energy. Um, so you don't lose the same, so it's easier to walk if you've got a, a light rucksack than a heavy rucksack, for example. So you don't lose the same amount of um, um, energy every time you you the wave moves. Um, you lose the same fraction of energy. So it might be that every meter the wave moves lose, loses half its energy to attenuation. And because you lose a fraction of the energy, that then becomes a, 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 a very sharp fall off at the start that then levels out. So it's an exponential drop in energy, not a not uh, attenuation because an exponential drop in energy and therefore you have to make up for an exponential drop in energy with an exponential um, amplification curve so it's not a linear scale it's an exponential scale in fact um, dynamic range determines the number of levels of gray in the image that's exactly what dynamic range is so you you can imagine if you had a very low dynamic range say of two everything would either be black or white if you had a dynamic range of 50, you'd have 50 shades of grey, wouldn't you? And um, it'd be a much softer image with lots of, of, of greyness in it. So low dynamic range, very blocky, black or white, high dynamic range, lots of soft grey colours. Frame rate is inversely proportional to frequency of the ultrasound beam. Um, I bet you quite a lot of people said yes, because it sounds reasonable, but no, 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 no is the answer. Um, because what what determines frame rate? So what determines frame rate is how long it takes to take a single line in a frame, how many lines there are, and um how and and how long it takes to take each individual line is determined by the depth. So given that the line density usually is fixed or you don't change it, the two things that affect the 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 frame um, frame rate are the depth and the width. And the only way, the only other thing that could change it was if by changing the frequency, you change the speed of the wave. But you absolutely know that you can't change the speed of the wave. So you change the frequency, you change the wavelength, but the speed will remain the same. So that changing the frequency of the ultrasound beam has no effect on the frame rate. And that's that thing I was talking about yesterday, that people, you know, not, not, so I know that this question usually about two thirds of people get correct and about a third get it wrong because they don't clock that what this question is really asking is, can you change the speed of the wave? And the answer is no, you can't change the speed of the wave. Frame rate would be unchanged if the sector depth reduced by a factor of four, the ultrasound frequency doubled and the sector angle doubled. So if the sector width went from that to that, so you reduced it by to a quarter of what it was, then it would take a quarter of the time to go up and down here. So you'd have time to, it would take a quarter of time then to take the sector and your frame rate would go up by a factor of four, wouldn't it? If you double the ultrasound frequency, you have no effect on what happens. You just change the ultrasound wavelength. You don't change the, change the speed. So you're still four times higher frame rate than you had. And if you double the size of the angle, you double the number of lines. I can't put my fingers far enough apart to demonstrate that. If you double the size of the angle, you double the number of lines. It therefore takes twice as long to take each frame. So you get half as many frames per second. So you started where you started. You went up by a factor of four and came down by a factor of two. So you've still got a, a frame rate that's twice as fast as it would otherwise have been. So this one is false. The magnitude of the Doppler shift is directly proportional to the transmitted frequency. That's correct. You can either, if you want, remember the formula, um, or you can um, um, think that you know the Doppler shift is how much change there is between um, 
received and transmitted frequency. And if you've got a high frequency, um, then you are going to when you when you got high frequency, the wave fronts are close together, so it's easier to catch up when you move towards the last wave front. In that example of the the the, the siren yesterday, if the wave fronts are far apart. You move towards it you don't make much difference from there to there the wave fronts are close together you move from there to there you make a big difference so they that this is correct the the doppler shift remember is a doppler frequency which is the change in frequency the change in frequency is definitely proportional to transmitted frequency so that's true for however reason you want to to re remember it Imagine the doppler shift is direct proportional to the cosine of the angle between the beam direction and blood flow direction. That's true. We talked about that yesterday. That was Sokatoa, remember. You can only measure things in this direction. If you want to measure something in that direction, it's got two components to it. This bit across here and this bit down here, or this bit down here and this bit across here. As you instead of coming into the probe like that, you can go across the screen and up the screen. And it's this bit here you measure, which is adjacent. That's hypotenuse. So it's V cosine theta that you, excuse me, it's V cosine theta that you measure. So that's correct. Small ultrasound packets of a small bandwidth. No, we talked about it this morning. If you want a small um, ultrasound pulse, a small ultrasound packet, to get that, you have to have a big mix, like my little short journey to work. You have to have a big mixture of frequencies, so big bandwidth to get it. So you, they can't both be small, so that's false. Duplex doctor with a doctor with a narrow set available, and standalone doctor trace of similar temporal resolution. Duplex doctor, remember, you've got your um, um, uh, doctor at the bottom, at the top, you've got the live image, the live two D image moving. And what it's saying is, if you make that as narrow as possible. You won't affect the, the the Doppler trace temporal frequency. That's absolutely not true. And I'm just just trying to lead you up the, the garden path by using words like the narrowest possible. So it doesn't really matter. It's just trying to sell you a dummy. So that's false. You know that's false. And a high pass filter is used in displaying tissue droplet traces. Tissue, remember, moves a few centimeters per second. Blood moves a few meters per second. So tissue will have a low Doppler frequency. Blood will have a high Doppler frequency. So for tissue, you want to keep the low Doppler frequencies. So you want a low pass filter. So that's false. Aliasing. The Nyquist limit, the highest Doppler frequency you can measure, is twice the pulse repetition frequency. So the pulse repetition frequency is, if you remember, how often you look. And the Nyquist limit is the highest frequency you can measure. And if you remember that example where I was swinging my arm around yesterday, you've got to look twice as often as what you're trying to measure. So this is the wrong way around, isn't it? The pulse repetition is twice the Nyquist limit, not the Nyquist limit is twice the pulse repetition frequency. The bigger number has got to be the PRF, how often you look, hasn't it? So that's not true. The pulse repetition frequency is lower at shallower depths. What's that about? So we didn't actually say this, but if you think here's the here's the probe, and here's the the where you put the gate, then it takes two seconds to get there and back. So you can do that thirty times in a minute. So you can have thirty pulses going down here in a minute. So your pulse repetition frequency here would be thirty per minute. If you put your gate down here, it takes three seconds to get there and back. If it takes three seconds to get there and back, you can only do that 20 times in a minute. So therefore, the pulse repetition at at um, deeper depths, deeper depths is, um, is lower, and the pulse repetition at lower depths is at shallower depths is higher. So this is false. It's the wrong way around. And that means you'll get more, because the pulse repetition frequency here is higher, so the Nyquist limit here is higher, so you'll get less aliasing at the top of the screen and more aliasing at the bottom of the screen. So that's an important thing. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Aliasing is represented by variance, usually green. That's not correct, is it? Because if you remember, aliasing is high speed, variance is difference in speeds. So you have a high speed and zero variance. That's like a bundle of people all running in the same direction. You can have a low speed 
a high variance. That's throwing the money up in the air and everybody milling around in different directions. Or you can have a high speed and a high variance. That's everybody running away from me because I've shouted fire. But aliasing is not represented. Aliasing is not represented by variance. Aliasing is represented by you know, if you've got blue and red on your as your colours for the for the for the um for for the colour Doppler, it's represented by the blue colour touching the red colour on the screen. That's how you see you've got aliasing. <clears throat> Aliasing is best addressed initially by change the velocity scale. If you change the velocity scale, sure, you might reduce the aliasing. But in fact, the problem with that is that you then end up with a very small thing to measure. And you measure a small thing less accurately. So the best thing to do first is change the, the baseline to try and bring it all onto one screen. So that's not the initial thing you do. That's the second thing you do is change the velocity scale. The first thing you do is change the baseline of velocity. So that's false. Aliasing is reduced by the use of high PRF techniques. That's true. High PRF techniques have a loss of spatial resolution. That's true. You don't know if it comes from this gate or that gate. So both of these statements are correct. There's another question. There's two statements buried in the question, and they've both got to be correct for the whole thing to be correct. And they are. Aliasing is reduced by the use of high PRF. Correct. High PRF has a loss of spatial resolution because you don't know which gate it comes from. Correct. The whole thing is correct. Power Doppler represents signal intensity data. Now, nobody will ever have used Power Doppler, and um, um, it's, a, it's an old technique that really isn't isn't used um, 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 very much. So, um, this is in fact exactly what Power Doppler is. It's the Doppler signal intensity. Um, so how loud the signal is is used to construct the image, and um, 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 that's exa exactly what power Doppler is. I don't need to know anything else about about it. I only put the question in because it specifically mentions um, it specifically mentions um, um, power Doppler in the syllabus. Velocities measured by spectral PW and those extracted from coloured Doppler maps are expected to be significantly different. Yes. Because spectral is the peak velocity, color Doppler is the average velocity. So that's true. PW sample gate size is determined by the time the probe spends in the receive phase. So um, what does that mean? The sample gate size is how far apart the lines are in the sample gate, isn't it? So if you listen, from now till now, then that signal that you hear could only have come from between reflecting here or reflecting here, because that's how long it took to get between there and there. If, on the other hand, you listen between now and now for a sound, you've listened for a longer time. So the first time you listened, it could have come from here. The last time you listened, it could have come from here. So it's come from someplace between there and there. So your sample gate has got bigger. So this is exactly true. How long the probe listens for determines how far apart the, the bars are in the sample gate, because that's how long you've, you've um, the longer you listen, the further distance apart the, um, the, 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 the signal could have come from. So that's true. Side low artifacts are more problematic than mechanical rather than phased array probes. That's false. They both have got um, 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 side lobes, but phased array probes, remember, get these extra side lobes from, from interference called grating lobes, and they only happen with phased array probes, and they're much bigger side lobes than you otherwise see, and um, they're much more problematic. So um, side lobe artifacts are more problematic with phased array probes, so that one's false. Pediatric probe has higher resolution penetration than adult probe. You can't remember. You sit in an exam and say, my goodness, I can't remember which way around it is. But actually, the first thing you could say is, if you had a probe which had, you remember resolution and penetration sort of go together. If you had a probe which did both well, it's the only probe you'd use, first of all. So that means it's probably false. 
But if you remember, paediatric probe, if you think about it, is small kids. So in small kids, you want to see less far. So it's probably a paediatric probe has got worse penetration. And you and you vaguely remember that if one's worse, the other one's better, so better resolution. So um, um, this is false because it suggests the paediatric probe has got both of those things. And if it did have both of those things, even if you can't remember, if it did have both of those things, it's the only probe we'd use, so that must be false. Can you explain variance again? So variance is difference. So, you know, if everybody's got the same height, it's just it's a square of standard deviation, which you should be familiar with. So if everybody's got the same height, the standard deviation is zero and the variance is zero because everybody's the same. If you everybody's got very different heights, the average height will be five foot 10, but the variance will be not 0.5 because there's some short people and some big people. Just it describes difference. And in terms of echo, it describes difference in velocity, so it's directions and size of the speed. And um, so if all the blood's moving at the same speed together on a straight line, it might be high speed, so it might alias, but it's all the same speed in the same line, then everything's doing the same, so the variance is zero, because there's no difference. Whereas the blood's working in a turbulent way, Every blood, every blood cell has got a different velocity in a different direction. So there's lots of variance there. So the variance is high. So variance is turbulence or disorder, while aliasing is high speed. Okay, good. Right, I think we're going to hand over to Alan to go through the rest of the questions. Okay. Okay. Nearly ten past half an hour. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, get myself set up. So, in <clears throat> hypertensive heart disease, LV systolic function may be normal or impaired. <clears throat> it's a nice, straightforward one. True. It's associated with mitral annular calc calcification, and that is true. There is an association between the two. Aortic root dimensions are always normal. Now, they might be normal, but they're not always normal. As hypertensive heart disease can, uh, well, not uncommonly, uh, causes aortic root dilatation. So that's false. Um, isovolemic relaxation time would typically be elongated. So that would be an indication of diastolic dysfunction. As hypertensive heart disease um, results in left ventricular hypertrophy and diastolic dysfunction, that would be true. Left ventricular hypertrophy is usually concentric, and that would be true. And um, I imagine Grant has already covered the different types of left ventricular hypertrophy with you. So when using Simpson's rule, <clears throat> uh, single plane view to determine volumes will usually have the same accuracy as using a biplane view. So that we know is false. Foreshortening of the apex usually overestimates the ejection fraction. And that's true because foreshortening of the apex will uh, essentially underestimate then left ventricular volumes. And then when you look at the ejection fraction, it will overestimate the ejection fraction. Contrast echocardiography is used. Um, oh, so someone's asked a question. Is MAC always associated in... Um, so I'm not sure that's in this question, is it? Let's see. So maybe if you want to sort of be, ah, okay. So um, what do you mean by Mac? I'll just go through the next question. Why you... Mitral annular, uh, is Mac always associated in and so not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, this is hypertensive heart disease. Yeah, that's right. So hypertensive heart disease, there is an association between hypertension and mitral annular calcification. It's just a fact, basically. Contrast echocardiography is useful to delineate the endocardial border, thereby increasing the accuracy of measurements. And that's true if we don't see, um, we don't have good endocardial um, border recognition, then we, we can ask for a contrast echo. A calculated diastolic volume of 83 mils per meter squared 
squared would be normal. And I think that's probably false. And you just need to know, know the numbers and uh, do your best to, to learn them. Simpson's rule can be used to assess left ventricular function on any patient. And this is a bit of one of these always questions. So Simpson's rule is very useful when you have essentially a normal shaped um, cardiac chamber without say aneurysms and so on and so forth. So it can't be used on, on any patient. And of course you need good endocardial definition as well. So that would be false. Uh, pericardial effusions. So a moderately sized pericardial effusion would typically measure one to two centimeters. That's true. Um, a relative, relatively echogenic area anteriorly in the absence of a posterior effusion often represents a pericardial fat pad. pad. Yeah, that's a very good description of a pericardial fat pad. As pericardial pressure increases, filling of the cardiac chambers is sequentially impaired, affecting the higher pressure chambers first. So it starts off well, doesn't it? So as the pressure increases, filling of cardiac chambers is sequentially impaired, true, but it affects the lower pressure chambers first, hence the right atrium, then the right ventricle. Rapid accumulation of a small volume of fluid will only lead to a small increase in pericardial pressure. We talked about this this morning. So the effect of the pericardial effusion in part is related to the amount of volume, but it's also related to um, the speed of accumulation. So um, rapid accumulation will lead to actually to a large increase in pericardial pressure. So that's false. I do apologize then um, if you can hear a lawnmower in the background. Just, I'll just close the window. Um, a diagnostic feature of pericardial effusion is that it always tracks posterior to the descending aorta. I think that's the same as this morning's question, isn't it? That's a typical of a pleural effusion, so that's false. In the presence of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, typically systolic function is normal. That's false. Now, some people might have written true because often the left ventricle does look normal. But if you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that's an infiltrative cardiomyopathy. And so will have some effect on systolic function. Typically, diastolic relaxation is impaired, true. Apical hokum is a very common form of hokum. And um, I suppose if you're, if you're not sure, think about how many cases of hokum you've seen. And typically you're going to see the asymmetrical hypertrophy variant, whereas apical hokum, hokum might account for maybe 10% of cases. So that's false. Septal knuckle is a recognized form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So that's false, often occurs in elderly individuals and is not a feature of um, hypertrophic, well, is, is, is not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Subaortic obstruction is characterized by late peaking high velocity flow in the LVOT, so-called sort of scimitar flow, so that's true. If I'm going too quickly, just let me know and I'll, I'll slow down a bit just so we can uh, try and get through all the answers. In the assessment of regurgitation, jet width to LVOT diameter of less than 25% suggests moderate aortic regurgitation. So that would be very much indicative of mild aortic regurgitation. So that's false. A jet area to left atrium of greater than 40% suggests moderate mitral regurgitation. So that's typical of, of um, severe mitral regurgitation. So again, false. Well, Oh, I'm sorry. So that's, that should be a jet area to the left atrium of greater than forty percent. Suggest more. I think this is this is wrong. This should be false. That's um, severe mitral regurgitation. A vena contractor width of greater than 0.7. I'm not sure why we've got and the less than one. 
would suggest moderate tricuspid regurgitation. So that's false. That's suggestive of um, severe tricuspid regurgitation. A regurgitant fraction of 50% is suggestive of moderate pulmonary regurgitation. That's true. So these are some of the more obscure numbers that it's worth reading and learning from the BSC guidance. The density of the CW regurgitant jet is a useful semi-quantification of any regurgitation. And that's true. In the presence of Marfan syndrome, an aortic size, sinus dimension of greater than four could be diagnostic of cardiovascular involvement. So essentially they're saying, can, can Marfan's syndrome result in aortic root dilatation? And that is true. A clearly defined sinotubular junction is usually seen in patients with aortic involvement. So that's false. We tend to lose the sinotubular junction definition. Cardiovascular involvement only involves the aortic root. Um, so that's false. It can uh, typically involves the mitral valve resulting in mitral regurgitation. Aortic regurgitation may be present and it can involve other areas too. Aortic regurgitation may be present and that will be true. And the regurgitation is, is usually going to be secondary to aortic root dilatation resulting in aortic of annular dilatation and a central regurgitation. Lipomatous hypertrophy of the interatrial septum is usually present. Um, I don't know where that came from, so that's false. So we do find lipomatous hypertrophy, but it's not clearly associated with any particular condition, often found on uh, transesophageal echo and not related to Marfan syndrome. Cardiac syndrome X is a recognised cause, cause of resting regional wall motion abnormalities. So this is a bit of an old question. So by cardiac syndrome X, what we're talking about is microvascular disease or typical anginal symptoms with evidence of ischemia in the absence of epicardial coronary artery disease. So your coronary arteries look normal on angiography and typically it causes angina but does not result in myocardial infarction. So that's false. We don't see regional wall motion abnormalities. Um, a pressure half time of greater than 240 milliseconds would suggest severe mitral stenosis. And so the essentially the effective orifice area of the, of the mitral valve is going to be 220 um, over the pressure half time. So if the, once the pressure half time is greater than 240 milliseconds, um, the area will become less than one square centimetre. And so this will be true. Regarding atrioventricular septal defects, a common atrioventricular valve is often seen, true. The ascending aorta is the most common site for a coarctation. And so coarctation is most typically seen. So that's false because a coarctation is most typically seen in just beyond the arch at the beginning of the descending aorta, proximal to the origin of the left subclavian artery. Hence, clinically, we often see a difference in, in uh, blood pressure with the blood pressure being lower in the left arm than the right. So that's false. A morphological right ventricle is always connected to the right atrium. And so we know that in congenital heart disease, that is not always the case. So false. Typically with constrictive pericarditis, a large pericardial effusion is present. So that's false. That's typically in say pericardial tamponade. Septal bounce is often seen. And I was just discussing this with Grant, so that's true. A septal bounce is caused generally through an incoordination between the, the left and the right ventricle during relaxation and the high pressures involved. Um, and it's one sort of diagnostic feature of um, constricted pericarditis. So on inspiration, and th these are two part questions. So on inspiration, right ventricular inflow velocities increase by greater than 
So that's true. So we get exaggerated velocity change, be it a rise or a fall during constricted pericarditis. We also see it in pericardial tamponade. On expiration, left ventricular inflow velocities decrease by greater than 25%. And that is false. They would then, um, on expiration, they would increase by greater than 25%. So that it's essentially, it affects the left and the right side of the heart slightly differently, depending on whether it's inspiration or expiration. Low E-wave velocities are seen in the left ventricular inflow. So talking about low, low E-wave velocities, we'll be looking really here at a restrictive problem. And in constricted pericarditis, we don't, we don't have a myocardial problem. It's a pericardial problem. So that's false. Okay, so a calculation. Uh, the mean aortic gradient is suggestive of moderate aortic stenosis. So the mean gradient here, 48 millimeters of mercury. And um, so greater than 40 millimeters of mercury is, is mean gradient is suggested of severe aortic stenosis. So this would be in this severe range. So that's false. Aortic valve area is calculated at 1.2 square centimetres. Now, I did calculate this, and it, I got it to be 0 0.7 square centimetres, which again would be, in fitting, uh, would be in keeping with severe aortic stenosis. So that's false. And that was using the continuity equation. Yeah, very good. Typically, the left ventricle would appear hypertrophied, and that would be true. Aortic, severe aortic stenosis would cause left ventricular hypertrophy. The presence of significant aortic regurgitation could affect the severity of the stenosis. And that's true because it could give you a falsely elevated velocity across the valve. And that's why we need to also calculate valve area rather than just, um, just rely on velocities. TOE is always required to properly assess the severity of aortic stenosis. And I think you'll realize that just in general practice, that often transthoracic echo is um, absolutely sufficient to assess the severity of aortic stenosis. Although in some cases, transesophageal echo can be, um, um, is required to further evaluate. Okay, so that was false. In severe aortic regurgitation, diastolic flow reversal in the descending aorta is likely. So this is the worst type of flow reversal. So essentially that's true. Uh, pressure half time of 400 milliseconds is typical. So in severe aortic regurgitation, a pressure half time, I believe it should be 250 milliseconds or less. So that's false. So the pressure half time will become shorter and shorter in severe aortic regurgitation. Jet width to LVOT diameter of 60% is typical or 0.6. And um, that should be, I think, false because it should be 0.7 or more or 70% or more. Left ventricular end diastolic diameter of greater than six centimeters is a marker of chronicity. So that's essentially saying the left ventricle is dilated and the left ventricle would dilate in a volume overload situation over time. So that doesn't tend to occur in the acute setting. So the answer is true. Left ventricular hypertrophy can occur, and that's true. And typically, it's going to be eccentric left ventricular hypertrophy. So complications of myocardial infarction. So here we just need to think myocardial infarction is affecting the um, usually the ventricular myocardium. So can it cause aortic regurgitation? False, as the a, aortic valve and aortic root and ascending aorta are extracardiac and should not be affected by a myocardial infarction. Mitral valve prolapse, so that's true by the effect of either ischemia or infarction on the, on the papillary muscles. 
mitral leaflet restriction, and that will be true by the effect of wall motion abnormalities causing a mitral leaflet restriction. Aortic dilatation, and that's a bit like a question A, that's going to be false, shouldn't affect the aorta at all. Pseudo aneurysm, so that's true. And for those of you who don't know what a pseudo aneurysm is, it's essentially um, a very unfortunate, but also potentially you could describe it as fortunate consequence uh, or complication of a full thickness myocardial infarction, whereby you um, the, the patient experiences myocardial perforation, but that perforation is walled off quickly by my, uh, a combination of pericardium and thrombus formation. So you get blood flow in and out of the ventricle into the pericardium, but it's a walled off space. And typically a pseudoaneurysm is different from a true left ventricular aneurysm by the fact that it tends to have a narrow neck and you tend to be able to see flow in and out of the valve. Typically, the, the neck is less than is, is uh, essentially less than 50 percent of the diameter of the aneurysm. OK, and, and if that if the complication of myocardial infarction would also include a true aneurysm. So infective endocarditis, suspected aortic root abscess is an indication for transesophageal echo. True. Can cause heart block, and that's true. And um, essentially, that's usually due to aortic root abscess involving the, um, the, the conducting system of the heart, the AV node, and so on. Uh, and that's why, particularly in aortic valve endocarditis, we, we ask for serial ECGs to monitor the PR interval. Commonly affects normal valves, true. And, um, and what essentially we know that if you have an abnormal valve or a structurally abnormal heart, you as an individual are at higher risk of developing um, endocarditis. But because the vast majority of people have normal valves, um, endocarditis is more likely to, no, sorry, let's say this, endocarditis, if we looked at the whole population of people with endocarditis, the majority of them would have had normal valves. So it does commonly affect normal valves. And we've seen a particular increase in endocarditis amongst the elderly as people are living longer, coming into hospital, having instrumentation such as indwelling lines and so on, and, and um, succumbing to infections. Um, with, say, Staphylococcus aureus and so on. And those people would normally have had um, normal valves before the infection. Hopefully I've um, made that clear. Um, aortic valve vegetations may be confused with Lambel's excrescence. So Lambel's excrescence are little filamentous projections seen on the aortic valve. I think they're sort of like fibroelastic tissue. Um, they tend to be different from vegetations in as much as they tend to occur more on the ventricular rather than the aortic side of the valve. But they, um, they certainly can look like vegetation, so they, they have independent movement. So we take into account other clinical features as well. Uh, typically affects the right heart in IV drug abusers. True often due to um, injecting using dirty needles either into, say, the groin or other right-sided veins. Embolic stroke is associated with atrial flutter. True, so atrial flutter carries the same risk um, for embolic stroke as atrial fibrillation. Is associated with myocardial infarction. Now, we could argue, apart from the aortic valve, and aortic root complications I talked about earlier, practically everything can be caused by ischemic heart disease. So myocardial infarction can predispose to embolic stroke due to, for example, wall motion abnormalities, aneurysm formation, thrombus formation, valvular disease, left atrial enlargement, atrial fibrillation. All of these can result in embolic stroke. So there is an association between the two. Uh, there will be others as well is an indication for TOE if the transthoracic study is normal. True. And the things we look for would be a 
patent for them and ovale, particularly if there's evidence of, of um, right to left shunting, um, things such as Lambel's excrescence and so on, and sometimes very small vegetations that have not been picked up on transthoracic study or if transthoracic study hasn't um, given us good enough um, delineation. It can be caused by deep venous thrombosis. So that is true, so-called paradoxical embolus. So deep venous thrombosis occurs in the venous system. Um, clot can travel up into the right atrium. And if there happens to be uh, a, a right to left communication, for example, an ASD, patent foramen ovale, with a right to left shunt, so flow must be going from right to left, the thrombus can cross into the systemic circulation, the left atrium, and then cause an embolic stroke. Is associated with left atrial spontaneous contrast. True, so left atrial spontaneous contrast is that sort of swirling we see more often on transesophageal echo, but it can be seen on transthoracic echo, tends to occur in um, individuals have large left atrium, mitral valve disease, particularly mitral stenosis and, um, and atrial fibrillation. And there is a link between spontaneous left atrial contrast and embolic stroke. In mitral stenosis, left atrial enlargement is a late feature. And that is, um, so it's a, an early feature because um, the atria are thin-walled chambers and they tend to dilate um, pretty early with rises in pressure. Right heart failure can occur. As I'm, that's true, as I said um, earlier today, the commonest cause of right heart failure will be left heart disease, be it myocardial or valvular. So mitral stenosis causes high um, left atrial pressure that will cause high um, pulmonary artery pressure and then can cause right heart failure. A pressure half time of 200 milliseconds suggests severe stenosis. So I um, apologise, we've got two questions on um, mitral stenosis here. So a pressure half time of less than 220 milliseconds will be greater than one square centimetre. So this is more likely to be moderate than severe stenosis. A valve area of 1.5 square centimetres suggests mild stenosis. So that should be false. That looks like moderate stenosis to me. Mild mitral regurgitation is a contraindication to valvular plasty. So here we're talking about a balloon valvular plasty and um, typically balloon valvular plasty um, has a significant effect on mitral stenosis, reducing the stenosis, but can also worsen regurgitation. It tends to worsen regurgitation by a factor of one if we graded regurgitation from one to four with being that four the severest um, severity. So mild mitral regurgitation is not a contraindication to valvular plasty. So sort of moderate to severe or severe mitral regurgitation would be false. In diastolic dysfunction, atrial enlargement is common, true, and again diastolic dysfunction causes high end diastolic pressure within the ventricles and the, as I said earlier, atria tend to enlarge quite early on. And so it's um, a common occurrence. The E to A ratio is always abnormal. So we know that the E to A ratio essentially can, um, can fall and then pseudo normalize before, uh, before rising again. And so that is false. Tissue Doppler imaging is reliable in its diagnosis. And indeed, tissue Doppler imaging is probably the best diagnostic tool we have for assessing diastolic dysfunction. So that's true. Increases with age, and that's true, and, uh, is associated with poorly controlled hypertension. So that can result in left ventricular hypertrophy and diastolic dysfunction. So that is true. Right, in the assessment of left ventricular systolic function, calculation of the ejection fraction gives an accurate assessment of systolic function. 
and I'm in, I, I don't, I mean, it's, this isn't a great question, but what we're trying to emphasize here is that ejection fraction is not always synonymous with systolic function. It needs to be assessed in context of the rest of the heart. Okay. Uh, an increased E-point septal separation is an indirect marker of impaired function. And that's true. And essentially what we're looking at here is just using the um, parasternal long axis view using M mode, looking at the E point separation of the mitral valve. The bigger it gets from the septum, it's an indirect marker of impaired left ventricular function. Assessment of left ventricular systolic function in the presence of fast AF is accurate. And so we know as um, and, and as many echo reports do state that uh, in the presence of atrial fibrillation, particularly with high ventricular rates, we cannot be certain of left ventricular systolic function. So that is false. Myocardial performance index can be used as an indicator of global ventricular performance in the right or left ventricle. Yeah, so it's worth um, just looking this up. It's the TIE index, T E. I. And what this is, is a measure of, uh, um, essentially, I think Grant, Grant describes it as useless time is over useful time. So the isovolumic contraction time plus the isovolumic relaxation time divided by the ejection time. So essentially, the smaller the number, the, um, the, the, the better performance of the right or left ventricle so-called TIE index, if you want to make a note of that. 3D echo plays no incremental role in the assessment of LV function. And we know that's false, it can be, can be useful. Compared to normal, <clears throat> right, oh, prosthetic valves. Compared to normal native valves, their CW transvalve lobosities are similar, false. Periprosthetic regurgitation arises from within the sewing ring. No, it's periprosthetic. So peri means around the prosthetic um, valve. So it arises from without the sewing ring. So around the sewing ring, that's false. Metal valves should have no transvalvular regurgitant jet. So that's false. Often, say, for example, St. Jude and tilting disc valves, we see tiny little transvalvular regurgitant jets in a normally functioning valve. Panis formation is typically seen as an echogenic structure forming more than five years following surgery. And that's just a, almost a textbook definition of panis formation. It typically occurs more than five years following surgery. So that's true. The same normally functioning prosthetic valve will have the same normal velocity ranges in the mitral and aortic position. So that must be false as um, loading would be clearly very different on um, due to atrial um, filling of the, of say the left ventricle versus, um, and, and anyway, as I'm sure you all realize that's, that's clearly false. That mitral will clearly have lower, lower velocity ranges than an aortic valve. And the question is, is is peri and paravalvular regurgitation the same? So no. So and and this is what these questions are, are stating. So, oh sorry, peri and paravalvular. Yes, peri and paravalvular are the are the same. Right. So this is a question about the tricuspid valve, and Grant's put it in because it can come up, and it's going to be included in the file that he sends you with lots of interesting miscellanea. And essentially, um, all are true, okay? All five are true. So I'll let you mark all five of those. The one view that we don't have here is the subcostal view. And for your information, in the subcostal view, you see the posterior and septal leaflets of the tricuspid valve.
Um, right, I'm just trying to get the slide to move on. Oh, there we go. So in the parasternal short axis, so lots of bits about the um, aortic valve. So what I'll do, I think I might just draw a picture here. I can share my screen. Let's try this. So hopefully you can see the whiteboard now. And uh, let's see. So here we go. So aortic valve. External short axis view, and um, the the way to remember this is the no matter sort of what views you you take, looking at the aortic valve, the um, the right coronary cusp is always anterior, and the left coronary cusp is never on the left. Mm. There you go. Remember that, and you won't get it wrong. Right coronary cusp always anterior. Left coronary cusp never on the left. Hopefully that was worth um, worth drawing for you. Now I'll just, I'll just come back to answer the questions. Okay, so the AV cusp at the top of the screen is the right coronary cusp. So the right coronary cusp is always anterior. True. The AV cusp in the right of the screen is the left cusp. So the left is never on the left. True. The interatrial septum is at four o'clock. And I think um, so the interatrial septum is going to be about seven o'clock. So that's false. The right pulmonary artery is the left hand one on the screen. Yes, they're reversed. And the mitral valve commissor on the left of the screen is the anterior lateral commissor. And I think we, we talked about this in, uh, um, in, in the video cases. Oh, so that should be false because on the left of the screen will be the posterior medial commissor. So that will be false. In harmonic imaging, the valves may appear thinner than in conventional imaging. So that is false. They tend to appear thicker. Typically, the received frequency is half inch integer multiple of the transmitted frequency. And that wouldn't work in harmonic imaging. That would cause a cancelling out of the of the waveforms. And what we want to do is enhance the waveform. So it has to be a whole int integer. So that's false. Relies on the nonlinear properties of tissue. True. Is used by default on most contemporary echo machines. True. The strength of the harmonic signal increases with the depth of propagation. True. So tissue Doppler. The peak value of the S wave may be used in the quantification of left ventricular systolic function. Uh, OK. So the so the S wave is going to be due to um, systolic contraction. So that's true. Is not applicable in the RV. And um, why shouldn't it be? So that will be false. Oh, so someone's asking for answers to twenty. So I, shall I do that at the end? Seeing we're we're a few slides beyond that. The A prime wave gives the most important information in the assessment of LV diastolic function. Um, OK, no, E prime wave is the most important one. So that's false. Should form part of every echo examination. True. We just said that. I think we did on the previous question. Is a useful tool to assess the synchronicity of ventricular contraction. So true. We've, we can use tissue Doppler to assess um, um, looking for dyssynchrony. And indeed, we did try and use it to predict who would benefit from biventricular pacing, though um, um, initially quite exciting, but it didn't show that it was actually helpful with regards to outcomes, but can measure dyssynchrony. Okay, so which are correct? 
25 centimeters is a normal value for longitudinal strain. So we can tell that's false because um, longitudinal strain is a dimensionless um, measure of deformity. So it'll be, it'll be, it'll be a percentage. Okay, 20, minus 25% is a normal value for longitudinal strain. And so that's true. 25% is a normal value for transverse strain. Um, if I can try and get this big square to move, <laughs> I think that's false. Yeah. So transverse strain, 25% normal value is actually 50%. Yeah, 25% is a normal value for radial strain. And radial strain is the same thing as transverse strain. Radial strain is the what, how, what you see in the short axis view, while transverse strain is what you see in the long axis view. But it's really just myocardial thickening, which you know should be more than 50%. Excellent. And speckle tracking can measure torsion. So that should be true. Yeah. And so think... torsion is just torsion is just twist. Um, but you know, if you're going to twist a a big towel, you need to, to get the same effect as you twist it more than a short towel. So um, 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 torsion is actually twist divided by the length of the thing you're twisting, in this case, the length of the ventricle, which is a measure of, 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 of um, the effect of the twist. All right. And thank you for people on the chat who've answered some of those questions for us. So yeah, the, the, the tricuspid valve all were true. And um, and thank you for answering the one on the parastone long axis view of the aortic valve. So what is the answer for A? In this question is false. And the reason it's false is because strain is dimensionless. So 25% or minus 25% will be true, but 25 centimetres is not. Um, can you tell us normal values of strain. So um, I'm taking this from, uh, I don't do a lot of this, but from Grant that longitudinal strain minus 25% is a is a normal value. But so minus 20 want... or less. So less being, you know, a bigger number. So minus 20 or less for longitudinal strain and um, for radial strain, which is just the thickening of the myocardium, 50% or more. Right. And so would you like those answers repeating again? I think you've got that now. OK. Oh. Yes, please. All right. So A, false. B, true. I tried moving it. Yeah, it's got stuck again. <laughs> OK. Oh, we've got another one. Sorry. So the, the, the answers were um, that set, the one with centimetres was false. The one with longitudinal strain of 25% is true. The one with radial strain of should be 50% or more. It said 25%, so that's false. The same with the transverse strain. I can't remember the last one. Yeah. So so B and, B and E were true. The others were false. OK. OK. Right. So regarding the E prime velocity, in the normal heart, Lateral E prime is greater than medial E prime, so that's true. Because the, in the in the normal heart, the lateral wall has got nothing holding it up, so it moves more. The S wave is is bigger than the septal S wave, and the the relaxation is also faster. So the E primed wave in the lateral wall is more than the E primed wave in the in the um the septal wall. So that's true. Okay, in restricted cardiomyopathy, the lateral E prime is reduced. So that um, is also true yeah. because in a cardiomyopathy, you get impaired. Oh, goodness. In a cardiomyopathy, you get impaired function. And um, um, so the S wave, all, 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 the, all of the speeds go down. So the S wave goes down and the relaxation speeds go down as well. Everything goes down. So E primed being reduced is exactly what you expect in a, in a cardiomyopathy. So that's true. Constriction. So normally, E over E primed, if it's high, suggests a high left atrial pressure. There's a specific exception to that. That's pericardial constriction. The opposite happens. Um, and in, in pericardial constriction, if you measure, and only in pericardial constriction, if you measure low E over E primed, 
that suggests a high left atrial pressure and that's called annulus paradoxus and um, it's really small print stuff but has cropped up in exam which is why we put it into the into this question um, annulus reversus is seen in restrictive cardiomyopathy no annual reversus reversus is seen in constrictive pericarditis so that's false and um, in annulus reversus medial E primed is more than the lateral E primed, and that's true. So again, this happens in constrictive pericarditis only that you see that the 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 the, the, the speed swap over. So instead of the lateral wall moving quicker, you see the septum moves quicker. Um, so um, that's it. Yeah. So so that's that's that. We're going to stop there. We're going to have fifteen. Um, um, 